Broadcasting from the radio studios of the Platinum Point Yacht Club, the PPYC players present A Christmas Carol. When Charles Dickens presented this novella to the world over a hundred years ago, people everywhere saw in it their favorite fictional chronicle of what Christmas was meant to be. From the day of its first printing, families have been observing the tradition of reading this story of redemption as part of their Christmas celebrations. So, in keeping with this long-observed tradition and the spirit of Christmas, let's fill your cups with Christmas cheer, gather the family, bring them near, all sit by the fire, enjoy its glow, as I tell you the story of one man's woe. Marley was dead. To begin with, there's no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it. Old Marley was dead, as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. How could he know otherwise? Marley was Scrooge's only friend because no one else could tolerate either of them. Between the two, there wasn't an ounce of heart, not a tuppence of compassion. They were business partners, for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend, and his sole mourner. Ah, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, was Scrooge hard and sharp as a flint, secret and self-contained, and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. And once upon a time... Of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve. Here we come a wassailing among the leaves so green. Here we come a wandering so fair to be seen. Love and joy come to you, and to you your wassail too. And God bless you and send you a happy new year. Old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house, a grim, cheerless place if there ever was one. Though it was only mid-afternoon, it was dark and foggy outside. It had been that way all day. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, Bob Cratchit, who, in a cold and dismal little cell beyond, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal. But he couldn't replenish it for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room. The poor clerk wore a long black scarf to keep out the bitter cold and tried to keep himself at the candle, for Scrooge was too stingy to keep a warm blazing fire at the hearth. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ 19, was saved, 20, Christmas 20, 21, 22, let nothing you dismay. 23, 26, 29, 9, carry 2, was born on Christmas Day. 17, 13, 17, 7. Uh, yes, Mr. Scrooge. Stop that infernal caterwauling. Yes, sir. 9, 15, 17. Every year, this infernal noise at my door. My very door. Get away. Get away, I say. Go somewhere else and bellow your blasted carols. Why, Governor, it's an old custom at Christmas time, you know. Yes, 
And I don't want any of your old customs. Take your fellow fools and go away. Christmas. Bah, humbug. Right, sir. Merry Christmas anyway, sir. Cratchit, copy that letter from Higgins and Thorne. Then finish posting this ledger. After that, you can pop over to Pennygirls and tell Efren Pennygirl you've come after the 17 shillings and sixpence he owes me since Michaelmas. And tell him I shall have a constable over there if he doesn't pay up at once. Mr. Pennygirl's wife has been ill, sir. What do I care about his wife? I want my 17 and six. Uh, I, I just thought it being Christmas, sir. Christmas? Christmas? You mentioned that word to me once more, Bob Cratchit, and I'll... A Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. A Merry Christmas, Mr. Cratchit. Merry Christmas, Mr. Fred. Bah, humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle? No, I'm sure you don't mean that. I mean just that. Exactly that. Merry Christmas? What right have you to be merry? What reason have you? You're poor enough. Well, what right do you have to be dismal about Christmas, Uncle? You're rich enough. Bah, humbug. I only want to wish you a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Don't be cross. What else can I be when I live in such a world of fools? What's Christmas to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Uncle. Nephew, keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Well, then leave it alone. What do you want? A Christmas gift, I've no doubt. A Merry Christmas. How much good has it ever done you? There are many things that I have derived good from, but have not profited materially. I dare say, Uncle, I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. And therefore, Uncle, although it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. God bless Christmas. Let me hear not another sound out of you, Bob Cratchit. You're quite a powerful speaker, nephew. I wonder why you don't go into Parliament. You talk enough nonsense. Oh, don't be angry, Uncle. Dine with us tomorrow. My wife is preparing a Christmas dinner that a king would envy. I am not a king. Mother thought you were. My sister is dead, and it is a charity that she is, so she cannot see what a worthless rogue her son has become. As to dinner, I'll dine alone, thank you. But why? Why? Why did you get married against my wishes? Why? Because I fell in love with a wonderful girl. Because you fell in love? And I fell in love with being alone. Nay, Uncle, but you never came to see me before I was married. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? I'm sorry with all my heart to find you so determined. I have made the attempt to honor Christmas and I'll keep that good spirit to the last. A Merry Christmas, 
and a happy new year to you, uncle, and a very Merry Christmas, and a happy new year to you and your family, Mr. Cratchit. Oh, thank you, Mr. Fred. Same to you, sir. Good day, sir. Such nonsense and twattle. Talking of Christmas and not two sixpence to jingle together in his trouser pockets. Cratchit, what are you doing there? Stop this instant. I'm only putting a bit more coal in the fire, Mr. Scrooge. See, it is so cold in here, sir. You put that coal back into the scuttle? A fire? A fire indeed? I can tell you, Bob Cratchit, if you use coal at that rate, you and I will be soon parting company. Do you understand that? There's many a young gentleman who would like your situation. I'm sorry, sir. My fingers were getting a little stiff with the cold. Then put on a pair of mittens. There's someone at the door. <clears throat> See who it is. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Is this the firm of Scrooge and Marley? Yes, ma'am. I should like to see the head of the firm, if I may. Uh, it's for you, sir. Of course it's for me. You're not receiving callers, are you? Show them in. Right this way, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Marley's dead. Seven years tonight. What is it you want? I have no doubt that his kindness is well represented by his surviving partner. Here, sir, my card. Kindness? No doubt of it. All right, all right. What is it you want? At this festive season of the year. It's winter and it's cold. Well, now, Mr. Scrooge, at this season of the year, it's only fitting to make some slight provision for the poor and penniless who suffer greatly from the cold. You don't say? Sir, many thousands are in want of the simplest comforts. Are there no debtor prisons? Well, there are plenty of prisons, sir. And the workhouses? They're still in operation, I trust. I wish I could say they are not, but they are, sir. The treadmill and the poor law are still in full strength, then? Yes, sir. Ah, I'm glad to hear that. I was afraid, from what you said at first, that something had occurred to stop their operation. No, sir. All these institutions that you mention are flourishing. But it's nevertheless true that some additional provision for the poor and destitute must be made. I see. A few of us are endeavoring to raise such a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What may I put you down for? Nothing. Oh, I see. You wish to be anonymous. I wish to be left alone. Since you asked me what I wish, madam, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas time, and I can't afford to help make a lot of idle people merry. I help to support the establishments that take care of the poor. They cost enough. Let those who are badly off go there. But many can't go there, sir, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Besides, I've only your word that this is so. It's the truth, Mr. Scrooge. Well, so be it. That is not my affair. My business is. 
It occupies me constantly. Ask a man to give up life and means fine thing. What is it? I want to know. Charity? Damn charity? Good afternoon, madame. May the Christmas spirit be upon you, Mr. Scrooge. Good afternoon. Cratchit, show this woman out. Yes, sir. This way, ma'am, please. Ma'am, I couldn't help overhearing. I should like to contribute a tuppence. Cratchit? Yes, sir. It, it, it isn't much, but it's all I can afford. But there are others in worse situation than I. Oh, you're a generous fellow. I wish I might say so of your employer. Ratchet. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Ratchet. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yes, sir. Close the door, Cratchit. Firmly, firmly. Draft as cold as Christmas blowing in here. Yes, sir. Well, to work then. <sighs> 24, 31, 1, carry 3. A new scarlet tippet for Tiny Tim. A comb for Martha. 33, 3, and carry 3. A hair ribbon for Belinda. Four, seven, twelve, fifteen. Crotchet? Yes, sir. It's too late to have you go to Penny Grills. He'll be closed up for Christmas like these other fools. We may as well close up the place now. Yes, sir. It's getting a little dark. Hard to see the figures. I, I, I suppose you'll want the entire day tomorrow. Uh, if it's quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair either. But I suppose I can't do anything about it. If I were to take a half a crown from your salary, you'd think yourself very ill-used, wouldn't you? Well, sir... I, I... Still? You expect me to pay a day's wage for a day of no work? It's only once a year, sir. Once a year? Once a year indeed. A fine excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose there's no good talking. You must have the whole day. Well, see that you're here all the earlier the next morning. You understand? Oh, I, I will, sir. I will indeed. Good night, sir. And Merry Christmas. Bah, humbug. The office was closed in a twinkling, and Bob Cratchit, with the long ends of his black shawl dangling below his waist, for he boasted no greatcoat, went down a slide on Cornhill twenty times in honor of it being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as fast as he could to play with his family at Blind Man's Buff. Scrooge, on the other hand, took his solitary dinner at his usual melancholy tavern. Having read all the newspapers and spent the rest of the evening with his ledgers, he went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, had to grope with his hands through the fog and the frost to find the door. Scrooge walked through his rooms to see that all was right. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room as usual, old fire guard, old shoes, 
two fish baskets, washing stand on three legs, and a poker. All as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa, a small fire in the grate, spoon and basin ready, and the little saucepan of gruel. Nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet, nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in, double locked himself in. Thus secured against surprise, he took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers, pulled his nightcap from a chair and placed it on his head. Scrooge, now ready for bed, warmed himself before a heap of coals in his fireplace, sipped his gruel, and climbed into his bed, where he immediately fell asleep and began to snore. As the clock struck eleven, the cellar door flew open with a crashing sound. Followed by a clanking noise deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain. Scrooge immediately awoke and listened fearfully. He cringed at every sound and clanking noise. He knew not what was happening to make such a ruckus but then remembered something he had heard, that ghosts in haunted houses were described as dragging chains. I don't believe it. It's humbug. His color changed, though, when without a pause, something came through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. Marley. The same face, the very same. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, and boots. Marley? I could swear I saw an old humbug. Marley's been dead these seven years, all humbug. What I need is a good night. Ebenezer! Ebenezer Scrooge! Who's calling me at this time of night? Be gone from these premises, I say, or I'll have the law upon thee. Ebenezer Scrooge, dost that now recognize me, old friend? Marley, is that you? It can't be. You're dead. This must be a dream, a nightmare. Ebenezer! Ebenezer, open your eyes. Look at me. Look at me. Can it be you, Marley? Can it be? Why are you here? What do you want of me? I want much of you, Ebenezer. Who? Who are you, really? Ask me who I was. You're very particular for a ghost. All right, then. Who, who were you? In life, I was your partner. Jacob Marley? But you're dead. You died seven years ago. Seven years ago, this very night, Ebenezer Scrooge. Why do you come here? I must. It is commanded of me. I must wander the world and see what I can and no longer share what I would not share when I walked where you do. What's wrong, Ebenezer? Don't you believe in me? I, I do not. You doubt their senses, Ebenezer? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, because a, l a little thing like a slight disorder of the stomach can affect them. 
you you can't be a ghost. You may be an undigested bit of beef or a blot of mustard or a crumb of cheese or a, a fragment of an underdone potato. <laughs> there may be more gravy than grave about you, whatever you are. The change. Look at it, Ebenezer. Study it. Lots and vaults and golden coins. I forged it. Each link, each day when I sat in these chairs, commanded these rooms. Greed, Ebenezer Scrooge. Wealth. Feel them. Know them. Yours was as heavy as this I wear seven years ago, and you have labored to build it since. If you're here to lecture, I have no time for it. It is late, the night is cold, and, and I want comfort now. Ah, ah, ah! I have none to give. I know not how you see me this night. I did not ask it. I have sat invisible beside you many and many a day. I am commanded to bring you a chance, Ebenezer. Heed it. Yes, I, I believe you, Jacob. I do. You are our ghost. Oh, Jacob, my dear friend, bring comfort to me. Comfort? I have none to give. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger. Witty journeys lie before me. Ah, uh, seven years dead and traveling all the time. Seven years, Ebenezer. Seven years of remorse. Know that no space of regret can make amends for one's life's opportunities misused. But you are always a good man of business, Jacob. Oh, I business, business. Mankind was my business. Charity, mercy, benevolence, they were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Jacob, Jacob, don't take on so now. Jacob. Listen to me, Ebenezer. I, I, I listen, I'll listen to you, Jacob. I'll listen. So speak to me, old friend. Ebenezer, I am here to warn you that you have yet a chance of hope of escaping my fate. Do you hear that, Ebenezer? Yes, Jacob, yes. How shall I escape? You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that the chance, Jacob? Mark it. I do not choose to. Without their visits, you will walk where I do, burdened by your riches, your greed. You cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one, the second the next night at the same hour, the third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ended. Look to see me no more. I must wonder. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over? Ebenezer, for your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. Remember, when the bell tolls one, look for the first spirit. Jacob, don't leave me. Jacob, Jacob! Goodbye. the sound of the clock striking one, Scrooge was instantly awake. He was lying on his bed, fully dressed. Slowly, the curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them, as close to it as a suckling child to its mother. It was a strange figure, like a young girl child, yet not so like a child as like an old man. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, 
was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest of bloom was on the skin. Ebenezer Scrooge! Who? Who are you? Ebenezer Scrooge! I have come for you! Are, are you the spirit whose coming was foretold me? I am that spirit! Who? What are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. But what do you want of me? What brings you here to haunt me? Your welfare, Ebenezer Scrooge. Rise and walk with me. Oh, oh, no, not, not out the window. I can't do that. I, I'll fall. I am not a spirit. I, I am mortal still. I cannot pass through air. Bear but a touch of my hand upon your heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. Come, follow me. Where are we? What's become of the city? And there's, there's snow upon the ground. Where are we? These are the shadows of the things that have been. You recognize this countryside? <sighs> oh, I know every inch of it, every rock, every tree. And that bleak building over there? Ah, that building. I was a boy there. Yes, I, I went to school in that horrible place. Do you recollect that path? I could walk it blindfold. Strange you could have forgotten it so many years. Come, the school is not quite deserted. Let us go closer. Look through the window into that cold, barren room. The solitary child sitting by the feeble fire neglected by his friends and family left there still. Yes, yes, I know. Oh, I was so lonely. Everyone was off for the holidays. It's Christmas time. All the children are home. Oh. No, no, not all. See, he's reading his favorite story, uh, Ali Baba. Poor boy, it was his child's way to, uh, to lose being alone in, in dreams, dreams. Never matter if they were all nonsense. Yes, nonsense, but, but he'll be all right. He'll outgrow it, yes. Yes, he did outgrow it, the nonsense. Became a man, and yes, yeah, successful, rich. Never matter, never matter. Your lip is trembling, Scrooge. And what is that on your cheek? It's nothing, uh, nothing at all. Uh, I, I wish I, ah, uh, it's too late now. What's the matter? Nothing, nothing. Uh, the, the waves came to my door singing Christmas carols last night, and there was a boy like that among them, a, a poor, pale, thin little boy in a, in a ragged vest. I should have liked to have given him something, uh, that's all. Is that all, Ebenezer Scrooge? Come, let us see another Christmas. Do you know this place, Ebenezer Scrooge? Oh, I know it. I know it. This is the counting house where I was apprenticed. 
It's my old master, bless his heart, old Fizzywig, my master alive again and hosting one of his Christmas parties. Oh, this is fun. Pick your partners. Listen to him. Turn the corkscrew, thread the needle, and back to your places. <laughs> and there's Dick Wilkins. Poor Dick. Dear, dear, dear. Ye yes, and look, there's Mrs. Fezziwig herself, looking younger than any of them. Oh, and the tables, all loaded with roasts and cider, mince pie, and, and beer. Oh, what a jolly time we used to have. That carefree man with the light heart and the gay smile. Do you recognize him? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, merciful heaven, how happy I was then. A small matter for old Fezziwig to make those silly spokes so full of joy. Small matter? Small indeed. Isn't it? He has spent only a few pounds of your mortal money. Is that so much that he deserves praise? Shh. It's not that. It's not that spirit. Old Fezziwig had the power to make us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or heavy. His power lay in words and looks and in things so tiny that it's impossible to count them up. The happiness he gave us was quite as great as if it cost a... a, a what is the matter? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all, spirit. Something, I think. No, no. Speak! Well, only... It's just that I should like to have been able to say a word or two to my clerk. Bob Cratchit, that's all. But this is all in your past, Ebenezer. Your clerk Cratchit couldn't be here. No, no, of course not. An idle thought. Are we done? My time grows short, and we have yet another journey to make. Where now? Come. Ebenezer, here in this little room with a fair young girl by your side, do you recognize yourself? No, no, spare me this, I beg you. You're older now, a man in the prime of life. Your face has begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. Your eyes are greedy, the eager, restless eyes of a miser. No, no, please. She knows it too, that girl by your side. There are tears in her eyes. Once again, Scrooge saw himself. His face had not the harsh and rigid lines of later years, but it did reflect the passion that had taken root, and where the shadow of the growing tree would fall. The tears of the fair young lady by his side sparkled in the light that shone out of the ghost of Christmas past. Scrooge began to feel the pain and regret he had long forgotten from so many years ago, as he stood there and listened. It will matter little to you, very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can cheer and comfort you in the time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have not just cause to grieve. And what idol has displaced you? A golden one. Belle, have I changed toward you? Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so, until... In good season, we could improve our worldly fortune by our patience and hard labor. You have changed. When it was made, you were another man. I was a boy, 
You blame me because I've grown wiser? Have I ever tried to break our engagement? Never. What then? Your own feelings tell you that you were not what you are now. I am. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. How often and how cleanly I have thought of this, I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it. It can release you. Belle. If you were free today, tomorrow, can I even believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? You, who in your own confidence with her weigh everything by gain? Or choosing her for a moment you are false enough to your own one guiding principle to do so? Do I not know that your repentance and regret would truly follow? I do, and I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. Oh, at first it may cause you pain to lose me, a very brief pain, but soon it will be dim like a half-remembered dream an unprofitable dream, and you will be glad to be awake from such a dream. May you be happy in the life you've chosen, dear Ebenezer. She left him. As they parted, he watched her walk away, his feet bonded to the floor, unable to move, his heart pounding in his chest. But he was unable to say those three words. Those three words, I love you. If only he had said them, those three little words, the world would not be such a cold, lonely place for one Ebenezer Scrooge. When she was out of sight, he turned and walked away. Time to go back to the office where there were debts to be collected and gold to be counted. That's enough. Show me no more. These were shadows of the things that have been, that they are what they are. Do not blame me. No, no more, no more. Leave me. I have done with them and I have shall live with them as I have these many years. One shadow more. Come. Ebenezer Scrooge, this man might have been you, and the woman beside him, your wife, and that girl, that girl might have been your daughter, Ebenezer Scrooge. She might have called you father. She might have been the springtime and the haggard winter of your life. Spirit, let me go. Show me no more. Listen now while they speak, Ebenezer. Bill, I saw an old friend of yours today. Who was it? Guess. How can I? It, oh, I know, Ebenezer. Ebenezer it was. I passed his office window. It wasn't shuttered. And there was a candle inside, so I couldn't help seeing him. His partner Molly lies at the point of death, I hear. And there he sat, all alone. Quite alone in the world, I do believe. No, I will not see it. I will not. Molly dies. I could not prevent it. I did not choose for him to die on Christmas Day. And when his day was chosen, what did you do then? I looked after his affairs. His business? Yes, his business, mine. It was all I had, all that I could do in this world. I have nothing to do with the world to come after. Spirit, I, I can't bear any more. Leave me, haunt me no longer. Take me back. Then I will leave you. 
wait, not yet. First tell me what I must do. What of the other spirits? They will come. And you? Goodbye, Ebenezer. I am always with you. Oh, sleep, sweet sleep. Take me from these nightmares. Bring me peace. Bring me peace. awakened suddenly and sat bolt upright in his own bed. He remembered the words of Marley's ghost and wondered from which direction the second specter would appear. At that moment, nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now, being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing. As he sat in his bed, he became aware gradually of a great blaze of ruddy light, which seemed to shine upon him from the adjoining room. He got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. It was his own sitting room, no doubt about that. But it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove, from every part of which... Bright gleaming berries glistened, and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as had never been known in Scrooge's time, or for many and many a winter season gone. Heaped up on the floor, to form a kind of throne, were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. In easy state upon this couch there sat the spirit, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up high up to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Fezziwig? Hello, Scrooge. But, but you can't be not Fezziwig. Do you see me as him? I do. And hear me as him? I do. No, Ebenezer Scrooge. Look upon me. You have never seen the like of me before. I am the ghost of Christmas present. What? You see what you will see, Scrooge, no more. Spirit, uh, conduct me where you will. Uh, I went forth last night on a compulsion and learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe, Ebenezer Scrooge. me, spirit? A humble dwelling in a humble street. It's humble enough. Yet there is happiness there. Who, who are these people? Who's that woman and the children? 
These are the family of your Clark, Bob Cratchit. See there, his wife dressed out but poorly in a twice turned gown, but braid and ribbons, which are cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence. She's laying the table for their Christmas dinner, and there, assisting her, is her daughter Belinda, also brave in ribbons, and the young man with the fork and the stuffing. That's Master Peter Cratchit, and the two little Cratchits. Listen, Scrooge. Here's Martha, Mother. Here's Martha. Martha, there's such a big goose and a special Christmas plum pudding for dessert. We've been cooking for days. I helped mother make the applesauce with the chunks of apples, just as you like. And Peter peeled all the potatoes. I bless your heart alive, Martha, my dear. How late you are. Merry Christmas, mother. We did a deal of work to finish up last night and had to clear away this morning. Well, never mind, so long as you are come. Sit down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm. Where's father? He's been to church with Tiny Tim. They'll be along directly. How is Tiny Tim, Mother? Any better at all? Sometimes I think he is. And sometimes I think, oh, dear God, if anything should happen to Tiny Tim. Oh, mother, you mustn't even think such a thing. Here they are, Mother. Father's here, and he's carrying Tiny Tim on his shoulders. Merry Christmas, everybody. Martha, welcome, my dear. Merry Christmas, Father. Oh, Father, I'm so glad to be home. And we're so glad to have you, Martha. And how did Tiny Tim behave in church? Oh, as good as gold and better. I like church, Mother. They sang the nicest songs. I hope people saw me there. Saw you there? Why, Tim? Because I am a crippled mother, and if they see my crutch, it might be pleasant for them to remember upon Christmas Day who made the lame to walk and the blind to see. Oh, bless you, my son. Can we eat now, mother? I've sweetened the applesauce. Peter has mashed the potatoes, and Martha's dusted all the plates. Yes, children, we're all ready. Come, come take your places now. Bob, bring the goose. There's plenty of stuffing and dressing and plum pudding for all of you. Martha, you take care of Tiny Tim. Yes, Mother. You see that he eats plenty. Now, sit down, sit down, everyone. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. A toast. Shall we have a toast to Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast? The founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon and hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, the children, it's Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, when one drinks to the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor dear. My dear, Christmas Day. I'll drink to his health for your sake in the days, not for his. Long life to him, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. If he cannot, we must be happy for him. Let us be thankful for this bountiful feast. A merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless us, everyone. Spirit, I have seen enough. Tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, 
Oh no, kind spirit, say he'll be spared, say he'll live. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race will find him here. What then? If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. There was nothing of high mark in all of this. They were not a handsome family, these Cratchits. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty and had known, very likely, the insides of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. When at last they faded, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. Many calls Scrooge made that night with the ghost of Christmas present. Down among the miners they went, who labor in the bowels of the earth, and out to sea among the sailors at their watch, dark, ghostly figures in their several stations. Much they saw, and far they went, and many places they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful, on foreign lands, and they were close at home, by poverty, and it was rich, in almshouse, hospital, and jail, where vain man in his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out, the spirit left his blessing. It was a long night, if it was only a night. And it was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. Our spirits' lives so short. My life upon this globe is very brief. It ends tonight, tonight at midnight. The time is drawing near. Hark, the chimes are ringing. The hour has come. about him for the ghost. It had vanished, and he found himself once more in his bed in his dressing gown with his nightcap on his head. He heard the clock strike, and then he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes beheld the third spirit, a solemn phantom, shrouded in black, draped and hooded, coming towards him slowly and silently, like a mist along the ground. I know you. You you are the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You'll show me the shadows of things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us. Answer me, spirit, ghost of the future. I fear you more than any specter I've seen, yet I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, lead on, lead on, the night's waning fast and time's precious. Spirit, why, why have you brought me here again, here to Bob Cratchit's home? But it's not the same. Why it's is so quiet, so very quiet here. <laughs> Mother, Mother, please. Oh, my son, my little son, Tiny Tim. I loved him so. Oh, Mother dear, you mustn't. It's almost time for Father to be home. Don't let him see you crying. Yes, yes, Martha. 
the light tires my eyes so. They're better now. It makes them tired to try to see by the firelight. And I wouldn't show reddened eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time now. He's late tonight. Past it, but I think he's walked a little slower than he used to these last few evenings, Mother. I have known him walk with, I have known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulders, very fast indeed. And so have I, often. But he was very light to carry, and his father loved him so that it was no trouble, no trouble. And there's your father at the door. Smiles, everyone, smiles. Good evening, my dear. You're late, Bob. Yes, I'm sorry, my dear. I, I went to the churchyard today. I wish you could have gone with me. It would have done your heart good to see how sweet and green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little, little child, my little child. Father. It's God's will. Uh, I'm trying to understand it, my dear. Although he was a little, little child, he was always so patient, so mild. I loved him so, my tiny Tim. He died? No, no! Can't you give me one ray of hope that I may change all that? That tiny Tim may live? Where are you taking me now? Here on a common street, spirit? What is it there for me to learn here? Who, who are these men? I don't know much about it, Governor. Either way, I only know he's dead. When did he die? Last night, I believe. Why? What was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. God knows. What has he done with his money? I hadn't heard. Left it to his company, perhaps. He hadn't left it to me. That's all I know. It's likely to be a very cheap funeral. For upon my life, I don't know anybody to go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. I don't mind going lunches provided, but I must be fed if I make one. <laughs> uh, 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 well, when I come to think of it, I'm not at all sure that I wasn't his most particular friend, for we used to stop and speak whenever we met. I'm most disinterested to go to his funeral, for I never wear black gloves and I never eat lunch. But I'll offer, if anybody else will. Spirit, help me. Who is this man that died? Is there no one to mourn the poor creature? No one to follow him to the grave? Perhaps they'll give him a green grave, at least like poor Tiny Tim, perhaps. <laughs> Now, merciful heaven, a uh, churchyard, overrun by grass and weeds, choked with too much burying, desolate, lonely, crumbling gravestones. Spirit, before I draw nearer to that gravestone, answer me one question. Are, are these shadows of things that will be, or are they shadows of things that may be? 
will, will you not speak to me, spirit? What is that grave to which you point? Ah, now I see it. Uh-huh. There's writing on that stone. The name on the gravestone is Ebenezer Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge! Oh, no, no, spirit. No, no, no. Hear me. I'm not the man I was. Why show me this if I, if I am past all hope? Tell me that I can change these dreadful shadows you've shown me by an altered life. I'll honor Christmas in my heart. I'll try to keep it all the year. I live in the past, the present, and the future, and and I'll not shut out the lessons that they teach. Tell me, spirit, tell me that I can sponge away the writing on that stone. Spirit, I beg you, spirit, I, I beg you. I promise, spirit, I, I promise. I, I, I promise on my knees. I, I promise. I, I, I promise. I, I, I. Singing? Is that music I hear? And what is this? It's my own drape. Oh, I'm home. In my own bed. Oh, I'm here. In my room. There's the saucepan that the gruel was in. Oh, there's the door by which the ghost of Marley entered. And there's the window where I saw the wandering spirits. It's all right. It's all true. It's all happened. <laughs> Scrooge frisked around the sitting room and danced around the fireplace. He stopped and stood in place, perfectly winded. Then, running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No mist, no fog, only jovial stirring cold. Cold piping for the blood to dance to. His joy burst forth as never before. In the sun, the sun's shining. It's clear, it's bright. Heavenly sky, sweet fresh air, merry bells. What a beautiful day. Oh, glorious, glorious. Oh, hey, hey, boy, oh, boy. Yes, sir. What's, what's today? What's that, sir? What day is it, my fine fellow? Today? Why, it's Christmas Day. Ha <laughs> ha, Christmas Day. Then I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. All in one night. Heaven be praised. How's that, sir? Listen, my lad. You know where the poulterer is in the next street? I should say I do. Aha, an intelligent boy, a remarkable boy. <laughs> then tell me, do you know if they sold the prize turkey that was hanging in the window? Uh, not the little prize, the big one. The one as big as me? It's hanging there now. That's wonderful. Go down and buy it, will you? Have them put it on my account and tell them to send it to Bob Cratchit and his family on Broad Street. And mind you, they're not to know who paid for it. Go along. Hurry, hurry, my lad. Oh, here, here. Wait a minute. Here's a half a crown for your trouble. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And a Merry Christmas, sir. Yes, and a Merry Christmas to you, my boy. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I'm as light as a feather, <laughs> as happy as an angel. <laughs> I'm as merry as a schoolboy. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas to everybody, <laughs> and a Happy New Year to all the world. Uh, my dear madam, how do you do? I, 
I beg your pardon? Well, you, madam, uh, aren't you the gentlewoman who came to my office in regard to that charity? Why, yes, sir. A Merry Christmas to you. Yes, sir. Allow me to ask your pardon, and will you have the goodness to accept? I prefer to whisper this. What? Oh, but Lord bless me. My dear Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? If you please, now not a farthing less. <laughs> the great many back payments are included in it. I assure you, <laughs> would you do me that favor? Well, my dear sir, I don't know what to say to such generosity. Now, don't say anything, please. Uh, come and see me. W will you, uh, will you come and see me? I will, I will indeed. <laughs> thank you. I am much obliged to you. <laughs> I thank you 50 times. Bless you. Merry Christmas. Next morning, Scrooge was early at his office. He went early for a reason. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late. That was the thing he'd set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No, Bob. A quarter past. No, Bob. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come in. At last he came. His hat was off before he opened the door, his shawl too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen, as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Fifteen and twenty-one, six and carry the one, twenty-four and carry the two, thirty-one and eight and nine. Cratchit? Yes, sir. Step this way, Cratchit, if you please. Cratchit, what do you mean by coming in at this time of day? Why, I'm very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are? Yes, yes, I, I think you are. Oh, it's only once a year, Mr. Scrooge. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. I'll tell you what, my friend. I'll not stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, Bob Cratchit, uh, I'm about to raise your salary. Um, Mr. Scrooge, are you quite yourself, sir? No, no, and thank heaven, I'm not quite myself. Merry Christmas, Bob. <laughs> Merry Christmas, my good fellow. A merrier Christmas than I've given you in many a year. <laughs> I shall raise your salary, and we'll see what we can do for Tiny Tim and the rest of your family. <laughs> we will discuss it this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop. Make up the fire, make it up, and 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 buy another cold scuttle before you do another sum, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. To Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh, and little heeded them. His own heart left. That was quite enough for him. He had no further visits from spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us everyone. You have just heard a presentation of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol 
Brought to you by the PPYC Players, adapted for our performance and directed by Tina H. And now for our illustrious cast. Scrooge was played by Tom F., Bob Cratchit by Tom B., Marley was played by Jean L., The Ghost of Christmas Past was played by Laurie B., Ghost of Christmas Present by Jean L., and The Ghost of Christmas Yet to Come by Gary B. Mrs. Cratchit was played by Laurie B., Fred by Scott K., The Gentle Woman by Kathy B., Belle was played by Ruth L., Belinda also played by Ruth L., Martha by Kathy B., Tiny Tim by Joan F., The First Man by Jean L., and The Second Man by Scott K. The Boy was played by Joan F., The Child Caroler also played by Joan F., and Fezziwig by Jean L. And your ever-talented narrator, yet modest to the core, yours truly, Jeff H. Our production manager was Pat B. The sound editor, Jeff H. Sound effects, Jeff H. and Tina H. The PPYC players wish each and every one of you a merry holiday season. PPYC players signing off. <laughs>